Hi, this is an introduction to Feynman diagrams. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how AQAA expect you to draw them. Now, they expect you to draw them with time on the y-axis and space or distance on the x-axis. Now, if you just look at these diagrams here, what you'll see is um, the axes labelled. Now, when you're drawing them, you don't need to put these on, but it's probably handy when you draw your first few to draw the labels and axes of time and space. Now, you can see on these diagrams here, the next ones, that you've got arrows. Now, arrows are always going forwards in time. Now, you need to make sure you're doing that, and not like this, arrows going backwards in time. Now, the Feynman diagrams you will be drawing will, will not have particles going back in time. It's not saying that particles don't go back in time, because some extreme crazy physics things actually can go back in time, which is cool, and you should find out about it, but for your exam, you don't need to know it. When two electrons come together, we know they repel and they move apart from each other. And this is because of the electromagnetic force. Now, what happens is we can represent this in a Feynman diagram. Now, a Feynman diagram is a diagram that helps us easily explain what's going off when two particles interact. And the most simplest form is an electron-electron collision. Now, this would look like this in a Feynman diagram. We can represent this by the two electrons coming in in space. Um, and as they come along, they come along, they get close to each other, and then they push away from each other due to the electromagnetic force. Now, if we show this as a Feynman diagram, what we say is we put lines in to represent where the particle is in space. So the two electrons come along like this, and they don't actually physically touch, they emit photons. And we actually call these virtual photons because they're really hard to detect. Now, we represent those by a little wavy line in the middle. But then, the electrons repel away from each other. So they move away through space, out, and then away from each other again. This can be shown accurately by the diagram that I'm going to show you next. Right, what we've got here is we've got a neutron, uh, and a neutron is unstable. Outside the nucleus, the neutron will easily decay into the most stable baryon of all, which is the proton. So, first of all, we know that something happens inside the neutron. The quarks change, and it changes into a proton. So, how is this represented as a Feynman diagram? Well, first of all, what we have to do is we have to say the neutron is here, and the neutron comes along in space, and then it decays into a proton. Now, because everything needs to be conserved, we need to conserve the charge, we need to conserve the baryon number, and we need to conserve the lepton number, we can work out which particles are produced. So, first of all, we have a neutron. Now, the neutron comes in. Now, as the neutron comes in, it decays and changes into the proton. When the neutron has decayed into the proton, um, the charge must be carried away. Okay, so the charge is carried away by an exchange particle. Um, this is the exchange particle of the weak force called the W minus particle. Now, the W minus particle takes away the negative charge and leaving the positive charge behind. So, we have two more particles produced. One of them is an electron. Now, it's just a regular electron, and that carries away the negative charge. Also, we have another particle here, which is an anti-electron neutrino. Now, it has to be an anti-electron neutrino because remember, we're trying to balance out this equation here. So here, we've got one baryon here at the bottom, which is a neutron, and it's got a baryon number of plus one. We've got one baryon here at the top, which is a proton, which has a baryon number of plus one. So baryon number one at the bottom, baryon number one at the top, that is conserved. So here, we have a neutral charge at the bottom. At the top here, we must have a neutral charge. We've got a positive and negative, making zero, so our charge is conserved. Also, we have no leptons at the bottom here. Um, we must have a lepton number of zero, which means we've got a lepton number of zero at the bottom. We must have a lepton number of zero at the top. So here, the electron, which has a lepton number of plus one. We need something with a lepton number of minus one, um, which is the anti-electron neutrino. 
Now, in a proper Feynman diagram, it would look something like this. Right, we're now going to talk about what happens when a proton changes into a neutron. Now, this doesn't ordinarily happen. The proton is the most stable baryon. It requires some energy. Now, the energy usually comes from inside the nucleus. So once you've got a proton changing into a neutron, we have this situation here. So as the proton comes along in space, it decays and decays into the neutron. So here's the proton. The proton comes along and decays into the neutron. Now, what's got to happen is we've got to take away that positive charge. Um, now, the positive charge is taken away by the weak force exchange particle, the W+. Plus. Now, the W+, plus, then, that then decays here into two more particles. And the particles that these represent are the positron, which is the anti-electron, or a positive electron. And also an electron neutrino. Now, again, the reason we know it's these particles here is because uh, whatever happens at the bottom needs to happen at the top. So here, we've got a baryon number of plus one here from the proton. We've got a baryon number here of plus one. So that's okay. Now here, we've got a charge of plus one at the bottom of the diagram. And because we've got a positron here, a positive electron, we've got a positive charge at the top. So that balances out. Now again, We've got no leptons at the bottom, so we have a lepton number of zero. Now at the top, we must also have a lepton number of zero. So here, the positron, uh, which has got a lepton number of minus one, because it's an antiparticle, and we must have something to balance that out. So it must be the electron neutrino. Now the electron neutrino has a lepton number of plus one, so we've got plus one and minus one, and everything is conserved. Now here is what that diagram should look like. 